Greetings, everybody. Uh, I'm Wolfred Driscoll. And I'm Lewis Normandin. We're with Wild Capture, a digital human studio. Uh, we're going to talk to you about volumetric video today. H have any of you used or even know what it is? Uh, can you raise your hands if you have? All right, well, we'll <laughs> our partner has, so that's excellent. Um, so, so volumetric video, uh, actually, I'll show you a okay, we're going to show you a little bit of our work, and then we'll go into it. In short, volumetric video being the process of taking uh, multiple 2D cameras and turning them into, uh, using them to combine uh, for a 3D asset. Um, if you're familiar with photogrammetry, it's, it's sequential photogrammetry, similar to essentially video photogrammetry. Uh, the data starts off, uh, basically, okay, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, there's different types of stages that capture volumetric video. There's large uh, sound stage type facilities. There's more portable solutions uh, that can go on set. And then there's even single camera solutions you know, for mobile, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a lot of it's powered by AI as well as uh, different machine learning type of uh, technologies. Um, what it spits out normally is a mesh with a texture sequence. Uh, in some cases, there's point clouds with color. Um, Usually the raw data is inconsistent and topology shifting every single frame. Um, there's something called temporal coherence, also known as track meshes, where uh, you can take a key mesh and track it over a series of frames and maintain topology. Uh, we've taken it to the next level and created a, a volume solver that essentially uh, point deforms the entire sequence as a single data set. Uh, so the UVs are consistent, the data is consistent, and you as artists can use our uh, characters. Uh, the real benefit is um, where motion capture, you rely on the bones, it may not be accurate. This is one for one a human performance. Uh, all the muscle flexion is all built into the character, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there's times when you don't use this type of technology. Um, we found out from talking to VFX vendors that uh, you don't do hero, you, we're not yet at the hero characters yet, uh, very extreme close up. But uh, for crowds, stunts, and as you can say uh, in our case study, we'll show you uh, CG fashion. Um, but there's a lot of hybrid use cases. You can replace people's heads, put them on a rig character, et cetera. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the data sets are pretty standard normally. Uh, Houdini ingests it perfectly, and there's a lot of processes that uh, you can do without our specialized tools. Um, in fact, a lot of the lab's tools cover a pretty good amount of stuff. There's a few Orbolt, uh, you know, handy auto rig tools that are a little bit further along than the ones from the labs as well. I think it's called Sauce Tools or something. Um, could move on, sorry. And so, uh, so obviously with attributes, uh, we, we start off with simply, all we have from the raw mesh is points, UVs, and normals. So factoring in that we're shooting in a fixed environment with the real world measurements, we're able to use both spatial, spatial solving as well as optical solving. And so we've combined it to create our own solver. And uh, go to the next one. So we started out purely in a Houdini pipeline. Um, can start playing. Uh, and, but we did, ex we did bring in some machine learning pose estimation, which is known as Markless motion capture. Uh, you'll see here, we solved this particular character with optical motion capture, uh, where we output the frames of the characters. Uh, you'll see in a minute uh, where we evolve that. But this is basically a test we did a while back, 
um, just to see where we could get with the uniformity um, you know, before we had any advanced solvers and uh, high frequency detail. And so ultimately, uh, if anybody's familiar with the topo transfer tool, this is essentially topo transfer on steroids. Um, but totally different, uh, I don't know how it was written to be honest with you, but it, it works in a different way. Um, so, so with this, as, as you can see, uh, this was imperfect, but this was uh, a couple years ago. And today, as you can see, uh, momentarily. So this is part of our fashion tests. And so there's our newer pose estimation that we use with the volume itself. And we're able to solve fingers as well. Um, and uh, we are licensing some machine learning uh, training data sets, et cetera. But beyond that, um, a lot of the cleanup process and a lot of the um, filtering, et cetera, et cetera, happens in Houdini. The, the texture, baking, everything, uh, that's where we started off. Um, and so, um, so today's case study is a fashion case study. This is an internal product project for us just to see how far we can push uh, CG cloth with our uniform solves. Um, it's in progress, so you'll see it's a little bit dirty in some of our samples, and uh, we've been rushing to try to get those together. Um, but Lewis will explain that um, when shooting this, uh, obviously good, good input data means good output data, so our company, Wild Capture, relies heavily on the cinematography, lighting, et cetera, and that's what Lewis's specialty is. Yeah, I think in short, uh, what we do for um, to provide high quality data going into each system that we work with is that we make sure that we're lighting for all axes. Uh, specifically, we like to use the reference for specularity. Uh, traditionally, in cinematography, uh, a cinematographer or, or director is trying to create 3D space out of something that is traditionally 2D, like a movie screen or a television screen. Uh, so we use techniques like backlighting and use of that Z space to really cr create that, uh, that illusion. But in uh, volumetric, uh, what we try and do is use specularity by providing top light that's properly softened and uh, able to be adjusted so that we can provide uh, a properly contrasted image that, uh, for, for each camera that translates into high quality, a high quality 3D asset. Um, so by using um, lighting not just on the Z axis and on the X axis, by applying lighting from overhead that is nice and soft, you can generally formulate uh, an asset that has uh, a contrast range on all axes. This generally helps us uh, you know, because in traditionally in cinematography, or sorry, uh, traditionally with lighting, you're using soft lighting to, to show contour, and you're using harder lighting to show textures. And a lot of that same principle applies here with volumetric. So here's a little rough draft of our uh, current state of one of our digital fashion uh, test projects, if you will. Oh, is it a second? Is it a and you see the glitch on the girl. That's not intentional, that's a mistake. <laughs> but what we're doing here is we're able to take what we, uh, take the ability of the cloth itself and apply it, uh, apply it to the body and have it automatically deform, uh, and basically automating the animation of the clothing to the body. So I'll, I'll go over a little bit of, uh, here's a tiny bit of the pipeline to kind of get into uh, one, we're, we're, gonna, we're developing a product called Cohort that's essentially middleware uh, that will be Houdini compatible and Houdini engine compatible outward, um, that which would include our solver, et cetera. But for the meantime, uh, here's, here's a few tricks. If you dive into any volumetric video, you might be able to pick up. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we solve pose estimation. So with the volume of the character itself, we're able to create skeletal solves. And uh, we use optic. We use the optical data in order to refine it, if you will. Um, and so we start off with our our volumetric mesh, which is uh, essentially just uh, photogrammetry uh, with a you know pretty heavy photogrammetry. And then the end result, we create a keyframe hero mesh uh, with quad remesher, and uh, we've got a few little tricks to uh, automate. The body having the right uh, the right uh, topology, if you will. Um, a lot of what we do has automation built into it, uh, and so you can see here we've got a cohort build tool 
which essentially takes that and takes in the information necessary and then applies velocity data from the skeletal mesh at the pose orientation. And then we're able to solve a lower res solution, this, this character specifically. And we find smaller topology for this has better results because then we go on to a secondary, uh, we, we run it twice through our solver essentially. The first time we solve it just for the body tracking, the second time for high facial details, uh, nuances within the body itself, repairing any broken finger type uh, anomalies, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, and then we go along and we use Houdini to filter the tools and we use Houdini to add subdivisions sometimes uh, when we need to manually add detail to custom areas of the body. So a lot of times there's head detail, uh, a client may want specifically head detail or the asset's gonna be downgraded to either mobile or something, you know, a Snapchat filter, let's say, all the texture has to be on the head at that point. So we have auto UV tools that basically take that into account. So here, oops, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead. So that, that's the auto, uh, there, there's the subdivide thing, uh, just a typical auto subdivide type of thing. And then on the right is the original UV, and on the left is our automatic UV that takes the skeletal solve and breaks out the body. And based off of the skeletal bones, we can give priority automatically to where the UVs will be built based off of that. And so, uh, so in this particular case, as you saw in those examples earlier, the rough ones, um, here's, here's a few tricks of how to bring marvelous designer assets in because I'm sure, uh, uh, if any of you have dealt with a lot of cloth, you'd find that the Marvelous Designer Clo 3D community has a lot more resources of, of 3D uh, cloth designers than there are in Houdini. And trust me, we tried to build tools to automate cloth creation and uh, you know, maybe we're not smart enough for that yet. <laughs> we're, we need to recruit, but uh, anyway. Uh, so, so within Marvelous Designer, what we do is we export out um, to, at this point, we export out the, the solved draped clothing on them as well as the flat, uh, the flat 2D surface. And the reason we do that is um, in, order to, in order to identify the seam lines that are gonna be uh, brought in. And so uh, generally we output Alembic and these are kind of the settings we use. And so basically here's the, here's kind of the workflow, and um, I, want, I want to take a minute and note that all of the, a lot of the CG circuit and side effects cloth uh, tutorials and presentations are infinitely valuable. Uh, we, we were able to use a lot of the tool, or a lot of the tricks that we learned from there to get really quality results. And so I, I recommend, um, I think at the end of the presentation we might identify those, but I would certainly look them up. Uh, and so through those processes, uh, we, we, we've identified a few things where you, like anything, you break out the different layers and uh, so that the cloth doesn't intersect with itself and it always lives above it, the other layers. And so, and we also, in some cases, um, we need to identify seam lines of objects that won't weld automatically to, uh, to the process. And so here's a, here's a little trick on welding that, uh, we picked up a few of these tricks and we refined it a little bit. But um, basically, if you, if you grab the unshared edges points, you start with that stitch, and then here's, here's a little code, I'll, I'll leave it up for a second. But basically, you can solve the seam lines on, on the, draped, uh, the draped cloth with that, that right there. And so as a result, it welds it together, or gives you the welding points. Um, so you don't need to go through a drape process. You can just automatically go right into the sim. And uh, the one caveat to that is, if you see it to the left for a second, there's a, a vellum cloth reference uh, copy of the original vellum cloth. And that's essentially a rest of the flattened one. And so we have to put a rest blend within the vellum solver so that when the cloth begins to solve, it doesn't droop down on the character. It, it, it starts off with that rest position. And so this, this is the welded character. And then as I mentioned earlier, sometimes we have to pin an extra layer because it just doesn't automatically take it. Um, 
And so here's the final result. Um, and we've been able to automate, you know, 30, 30 pieces of clothing a day at least. So it's pretty, uh, it's a pretty fun, uh, friendly pipeline. And, uh, you know, we've been able to add lots of pockets, inflatable things, and, you know, we love the Vellum tools for all of that. And so uh, here's a music video that's uh, going to be coming out soon with uh, just to kind of show, and this is a, this is a play blast, obviously, but uh, we're just showing the beginning of uh, she's dancing in the water and, you know, some of the flicks are a little bit off, but uh, essentially what we're showing is um, our, our characters are ready for all the collisions and, and, you know, the velocity is sound. So there's no extra, there's no extra work. You, we capture, we solve our uniform, we, we, it's ready for effects. And it's, 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 uh, can either be an Alembic cache, it can be an FBX, or it can be a USD. We're pretty, we're early adopters of USD. And so, uh, we took it to crowds. Here's where we were about two years ago. You'll see we only shot like five people. So please forgive that. But you can see that it, 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 it somewhat holds, if you will, you know, at least on, it granted we're not environment artists. So please forgive the poor environments as well. But, yeah, I'm really selling it. Uh, the, the idea in short <laughs> is that this was an early stage test that allowed us to demonstrate a proof of concept. That fact that we could take 500 people and have it at least somewhat believably look at, uh, you know, uh, turn into a, uh, 150 to 200 people uh, with, you know, essentially what comes down to no budget and just a tight uh, time frame for us to kind of kick out a demo. Uh, to see where we are now from there is uh, so now truly we, we've done 100,000 people and and it's in USD instant. And so now with Karma, this was Karma XPU, just took a few seconds. Uh, granted, uh, there's a lot of clones still. We're working on, uh, we're, you know, the more people we shoot, the larger the kits get. And uh, in this case, we have an automated algorithm to put hats and sunglasses on people, but uh, I went a little too crazy with it. But I still thought it was kind of fun to kind of give you an idea of, you know, how it holds up before it's been fully lit and integrated. Um, so thank you. And so here's, here's a few of the tutorials I had mentioned that uh, were pretty valuable about giving us a few tricks we picked up. So if, if you're interested in vellum cloth, I'd check these two out for sure, and the side effects talks. We'd also like to make sure to give proper accreditation to the artists that helped contribute to uh, a lot of the fashion that you see in this demonstration. And their names are listed uh, here and where to find them on ArtStation. Uh, also, last but not least, you know, the idea behind this, uh, this topic here was that we are uh, approaching a, a, a time and place for volumetric video where we are starting to leave the uncanny valley, where, uh, where, where with the options uh, such as the ones that have been presented today, along with many others, uh, provide high frequency details, provide realistic, lifelike, animated characters that when a user or an audience engages with them, whether seamlessly blended or not, you can get the effect and trigger the imagination that you're looking for, now leaving the uncanny valley. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.